Let's consider together what might happen when a brain, mine or yours, is connected directly to a computer. Let's take three specific examples. So imagine enhancing our human abilities with a brain-controlled robotic suit. Well, Hollywood's already done this for us. Uh, Hollywood entertained us with Iron Man. But what about a practical application of this? Can we, for example, build a brain-controlled robotic arm for a person who's paralyzed? As a second example, how about learning a new skill by downloading it directly to our brains? Well, as you guessed it, Hollywood's got that covered again. Uh, in the movie Matrix, Neo learns Kung Fu by doing exactly that. But what about doing something similar to restore movement in a stroke patient by, for example, repairing damaged connections in the brain? And finally, how about conveying thoughts telepathically and influencing other minds? Well, as you guessed it, that's exactly what Professor X does in the X-Men movies. But uh, can we uh, do this today? Well, I'm not in Hollywood, but I'm passionate about practical applications of connecting brains and computers. At the Center for Neuro Technology, which I direct at the University of Washington, we're building devices we call brain coprocessors. So what are these devices? These are computers that use artificial intelligence, or AI, to interact directly with the brain to help people. Our goal is to restore lost function in people with neurological conditions such as stroke, spinal cord injury, and Parkinson's disease. Now, in order to build a coprocessor, you need technologies to read and write the brain. So what does that mean? It means you need technologies that can record brain activity as well as send information back to the brain by stimulation. At the center, we're looking at three different ways of doing that. So the first one is called EEG, or electroencephalography. It's a, it's a big word. Uh, but what it means is you're recording from the scalp. So you're recording tiny electrical fluctuations indicative of your brain activity from the scalp. This is a complete, completely non-invasive technique. Another technique we're using is called ECOG, or electrocorticography, and this involves recording or stimulating the brain surface uh, under the skull. And finally, we're also looking at uh, microelectrode recording. So these involve placing wires, uh, tiny microwires, inside the brain so that you can record from actual individual neurons inside the brain or stimulate individual neurons inside the brain. So what do these uh, look like? So let's look at EEG. So what does your brain look like when we record EEG from your scalp? So those of you who are paying a lot of attention to what I'm saying and are very alert right now, your brain waves might look something like this. Now, there's some of you who have probably uh, relaxed a bit. You're leaning back in your chairs, uh, maybe a little bit zoning out. Uh, your brain waves look something like this, potentially. And finally, I really, really hope there's no one in the audience who has a brain state that looks like this. <laughs> so now, if you want to go uh, deeper uh, and get a more nuanced picture of the brain, you need to actually go deeper into the brain and use microelectrodes micro to record from individual neurons. So this particular picture here shows you the recordings from 150 actual neurons in the brain. And you can ask, what can we do with these kinds of recordings? So we can use these kinds of recordings by combining it with AI to allow a paralyzed person to control a robotic arm for the first time. So in this case, the AI trains the computer to learn what the human wants to do. So in this video from the University of Pittsburgh, a woman with paralysis was able to learn to control a robotic arm directly using her brain signals. And for the first time, she was able to feed herself a piece of chocolate after many years. A piece of chocolate. So you can also, uh, using a brain coprocessor, rewire the brain by using the coprocessor as a bridge. So in this experiment by F. Fetz and colleagues at the University of Washington, uh, what they did was they used the brain coprocessor to, con to, pro coprocessor to connect two brain areas, as you can see here. And what they found was remarkable. So after two days of this artificial connection between two brain regions, the brain regions actually got strengthened. The, the connections between the brain regions got strengthened. So why is this useful? Well, for, for example, you can use this particular technique for targeted rehabilitation of the brain uh, when the brain has become damaged due to stroke, for example. Well, you don't always have to uh, use invasive techniques to build a coprocessor. 
You can also use EEG, which you remember uh, is a non-invasive technique. So in this particular example, a human uses EEG to control this little uh, Iron Man-like humanoid robot that we call Morpheus. So Morpheus sends you images of what he sees, and the human can use EEG to select an object from the choices of objects in front of them. So for example, here, the human chooses one of these two red or green blocks. So the human chose the uh, red block using EEG. And the robot does all the hard work, picks up the, uh, the, the object, and the human can then tell the robot, again using EEG, which of these two tables to bring this object to. So uh, this actually was something we did uh, two years before the uh, original Iron Man movie. But sadly, the producers of Iron Man never invited Morpheus for an audition for the lead role. I mean, he would have been cute in the movie, don't you think? So instead of sending instructions uh, to a robot, such as Morpheus, can we send instructions directly to another person's brain? So in order to do this, you need technology to write the brain, like uh, Professor X. So luckily, there is uh, some technology right now. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. So this particular technology uses an electric current to, to induce a magnetic field, which then penetrates the skull, and then induces a little electric current inside the brain. So we can use this technology to, for example, send a signal to your visual cortex to make you see things, even though there's nothing in front of your eyes. We can send, this, uh, uh, we can send some signals to your motor cortex to make you move your hand, even though you didn't plan to. So that's a little creepy, isn't it? But uh, actually, it's a great example of how your brain controls what you see and what you do. So in other words, you are your brain. So we used uh, this particular technology uh, to uh, show for the first time that two brains can communicate with each other. So we combined TMS, magnetic stimulation, with EEG. So on the left, uh, you can see me doing my best impression of Professor X as a sender of brain messages. On the right is my collaborator, Andrea Stoko, who was acting as a receiver with a magnetic stimulator near his head. And we were actually located in two different parts of the University of Washington campus. And uh, we were playing a game which involved destroying ra rockets. But the interesting thing here was that I could see the game, but could not control it. And he could not see the game, but he had a keyboard. So we had to collaborate in order to destroy these rockets. And so I would imagine moving my hand, uh, imagine moving my right hand, so that I could, uh, the computer could then extract a signal from my brain and send it to his brain, and then his hand would move on the keyboard, thereby destroying the rocket. So here is our uh, Eureka moment, uh, the first time that we were able to send a signal from my brain to uh, Andy's brain. So on the left, I'm working hard, imagining moving my right hand. And uh, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, Andy moving his hand, but actually it's because I'm sending the message from my brain to his brain to his motor cortex. And you can see just a little bit of movement that's sufficient to destroy the rocket. So more recently, we've uh, demonstrated that we can actually connect not just two brains, but uh, three brains together in what we call a brain net. So in this case, again, the three players here had constraints imposed on them so that they had to uh, work together in concert in order to solve the simple Tetris task that's shown on the right-hand side. So this, in fact, uh, could be considered as perhaps the first social network of connected brains. <laughs> or as one of my students remarked, move over, Facebook, here comes BrainBook, <laughs> where you don't even need like buttons anymore. So we're working uh, to build uh, a more general-purpose AI coprocessor for the brain. This is to solve more complex tasks. And the interesting thing here is that this particular coprocessor uses something called artificial neural networks, which are currently uh, responsible, for, responsible for a lot of the advances in AI. Uh, in, and uh, they're also inspired by the brain. And for the first time here, what we have are artificial neural networks directly interacting with biological neural networks. Uh, and this opens up the possibility for a lot of different applications. So here are just some of those applications. Uh, we've already talked about some of the medical applications, such as restoration of lost function after injury or stroke, etc. But let's look at another example. So how about education and learning? So imagine a brain coprocessor that helps you learn calculus or organic chemistry, and it's able to detect when you've mastered all the material. So you know what that means, right? No need for exams or finals. Of course, all these applications bring up a whole bunch of ethical and moral issues, ranging from 
health and safety to security and privacy. And there are also important social justice issues. So for example, who gets access to augmentation with these uh, coprocessors? Is it just going to be the wealthy, or are coprocessors going to be subsidized, just like public education is subsidized today? At the Center for Neurotechnology, we take neuroethics very seriously. We have neuroethicists embedded in our engineering teams to guide the design process, as well as propose best practices to address some of these thorny issues. So uh, just stepping back a little bit, humans have been augmenting themselves by inventing tools uh, ranging from the wheel and riding to more recently airplanes, computers, and now the smartphone. So the question you can ask is, is the brain coprocessor just another augmentative tool? More importantly, uh, are they going to be ultimately beneficial to humanity? So this reminds me of the legend of the Egyptian pharaoh Thamus and the Egyptian god Thoth, who is credited with inventing writing. So Thamus actually complains to Thoth, and he says that the invention of writing by the neglect of memory will actually produce forgetfulness in humans. So he concludes that writing is actually a bad invention. It's actually not really beneficial to humanity. I actually disagree with Thamus. So writing actually freed up the brain from rote memorization to allow much more creative endeavors. So similarly, I think that brain coprocessors can also be tremendously beneficial to humanity. So it's, it's going to be a, uh, it's a new technology for sure, but just think about the number of people we could help. And not only that, but I think that brain coprocessors might take human creativity to new levels by augmenting or adding on to what a single brain can do. We could harness the power of multiple brains and potentially solve some of the hardest problems facing humanity in novel and unprecedented ways. So I'm therefore very eager and optimistic about our future. A bright future beckons. Thank you. Thank you.